Praise the Lord. Would you turn in your Bibles this morning to this wonderful letter written by Peter, 1 Peter, chapter 1. Great letter. Over the years has ministered to me greatly. One of the first verses I ever learned came out of this letter. But we're going to be looking today at the blood of Jesus Christ, the blood of the cross. And he says in 1 Peter chapter 1, looking at verse 18 and 19 specifically. And he starts off and he says in verse 18, Knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold, from your aimless conduct received by traditions, tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. And the first thing he does in verse 18 is says knowing. This is something that you and I must know, receive, understand, gain the depth of understanding. That everything you and I do is operating with the foundational knowledge of knowing this. You must know this, receive this, accept this. Knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things. And then he gives an example. Silver and gold. All the things, the very thing that people hoard, chase after, use to curb inflation and for monetary powers. And how many over the years has been chasing gold and silver? How many lives have been lost chasing gold and silver when there was a gold rush? Here in California, gold rush in Alaska. People gave up everything in search for a golden nugget. In search for some aspect of silver. My wife and I were in Arizona. We went to an old silver mine. And I say old because what? There's no more silver there. And it's gone. Old. Boarded up. Useless. Go into that place and it's just a, a, a memorial that people, this was once a thriving little town as everyone searched for and dug in the ground to try to grab some little piece of silver, what we call valuable and deem valuable. And still use it today in a variety of ways. And, and uh, even I remember there was not too long ago this, this uh, very wealthy man named Hunt down in Texas. And he tried to corner the silver market and bought all and tried to grab all the silver. It's all mine. <laughs> trying to get all the silver that he could control the market. When here the Bible comes out and says what? It's corruptible. It's useless. It means nothing. All these things are passing away. Yes? Yes. But the end, it says even in 1 Peter chapter 4, it says the end of all things, the end of all things is near. Written 2,000 years ago. <laughs> near. All things coming to an end. Whoever does the will of God, remember, whoever does the will of God abides forever. Coming to that understanding that knowing that you were not redeemed, in other words, we have been redeemed. Right? From our aimless conduct. And if anybody understands aimless conduct, and over the years I've preached and taught to that I had an aimless life. I was brought up with an aimless life. Didn't know where I was going, where I was stepping. Step here, step there, chase this, chase that, stand fast in stubbornness, a pride over overcoming, filled with insecurity, aimless, running amok. Literally, a, a comet had more direction than me. Aimless conduct, giving myself to everything that did not profit, even the chasing of gold and silver. Looking for something of value in life. Looking to have something of value in life. Never finding value in life. Seeking to have, to get, to go. Seeking to have, to get, to go. Let's go here, let's go there. I remember talking to my wife and we were just recently married and I trying to find a job, trying to find where I'm going to go. Trying to figure out what I'm going to do for my life. And I says, I'm, I'm going to Wichita. She just looks at me. <laughs> Going to be an airplane mechanic. They need airplane mechanics out there. Going to do this, going to do that. Then I shifted. All of a sudden I'm going uh, to San Diego, California. Shifted to there, shifted here, shifted there. Find myself now in Pittsfield. <laughs> what the Lord will do with a, with, with a plan. Many other plans of man. I had them. Aimless conduct. But God Almighty we paid a price over 2,000 years ago for a guy named Gary and for a person named you and put your name in there and he didn't use corruptible things like silver and gold he didn't redeem us to just continue to walk aimless did he? he's not looking for you and I he's got a direction for you 
Not an aimlessness. Not an aimless mind. Not an aimless heart. Not aimless feet. Not aimless hands. He doesn't have aimlessness for you. He has direction. And the direction is this. I seek a city whose builder and maker is God. I seek something that is not of this earth. I seek to have a relationship with someone who's not of this earth. They came to this earth but to call me home. And gave me the right to call him father. That God Almighty has given a price that you and I could not pay to make us into the people of God. Having a special place in his heart. Born of the living spirit of God. That God is making his own special people. He says it in Titus, God is making, Jesus Christ is making for himself his own special people. Precious in his sight. Born again of his Holy Spirit. He gave the Christ, God Almighty gave the Christ, a baby born, coming forth. A divine new man coming forth. And he came to eradicate sin. He came to redeem souls. He came to set the captives free. He came to heal the brokenhearted. He, aimed to, he came to open the veil to the brethren to eternal life. He came to pay the price, the redeeming price, the redemption price. The blood of Jesus Christ. Shed on this earth. All of the blood that were in his veins, pumped with that divine heart. His body housed divine blood. New man, not born, not brought forth by Adam and sinful blood. But divine, perfect, holy blood. Filled with the love of God. Filled with the holiness of God. Divine blood being pumped with that heart. Going into all these veins. It says that humanity is basically 1.2 to 1.5 gallons of blood. If you lose about half of it, you're dead. No longer able to keep. Your entire body is sustained with this one and a half gallons of blood pumping through your, your veins, your arteries. If the blood stops pumping... To any part of the body, that part of the body becomes dead, corrupt. Any part cut off. Any part cut off. Tourniquet. Put a tourniquet on. Get a cut. Tourniquet. You have to release it every so often to allow some blood to go in there or else what? Dead. Corrupt. Gangrene. Smell. Unclean. The Bible says that the life of the flesh is in the blood. Everything was about the blood for life. And when the blood was lost, the life was lost. Christ came, came and gave his blood. His blood was shed on this earth. That one and a half gallons of blood is still there. Still on this earth. Still in this soil. One and a half gallons of blood that came from Christ is still in this earth. And so is all the blood that have gone on before us. All the blood from Abel, the first shed blood. One and a half gallons shed on this earth. Killed by his brother with a rock in the head. Crush him. Blood spilt. All the bugs, all the birds, all the beasts of the earth. All of the humanity. How much blood is sitting inside this earthen soil right now? Think of the blood that has come forth over the years that just this earth just keeps holding on and sucking in more and more and more and more and more and more. Bones broken, fall apart, old bones. You look at the book of Kings or the book of Chronicles and you'll see that they took the kings and they gathered their bones with their ancestors. Today we've got archaeologists running around digging up more and more bones. Look! A bone! We've turned college degrees into dogs looking for bones. <laughs> Digging them up. Look, more bones. Look, bones. 2,000 year bones. 
thousand year bones. I got a three thousand here. <laughs> Everybody's searching for a bone. <laughs> Dinosaur bone. I'm a millionaire. Get a big bone, big femur bone, all kinds of bones, teeth bones, shark teeth bones. Anything. Is it not so? This entire earth is a graveyard. The entire earth is a graveyard filled with bones and blood. Bones and blood everywhere. But we just... What? Cover it up. All nice again. Build a house where we can have life on blood and bones before us. So, how many things are we chasing in this earth with our aimless conduct? If I could just have, if I could just get, if I would just be able to have this, have that, get this, get that, if I could just, I'm going to build a brand new house, right, a house right on top of bones and blood that have gone on before me. The birds, the bugs, the beasts, and the people, the cemeteries are all around us. We just drive by, walk by, and out of all that blood, you say, boy, you're talking an awful lot about death and blood. I sure am. Because you, must, you and I must understand the depth and the importance of blood and bones and death in order to appreciate the redemptive blood of Jesus Christ and the life that he has given to us. There's basically about 7.7 7 billion, 7 .7 billion people on earth. I don't know, sounds like a lot. Each of them carrying around basically one and a half gallons of blood. That's a lot of blood. Within a hundred years, all that blood and bones is going to be in this earth. If you took all of the people within a hundred years, seven billion people, and they're all died, and you took all their blood and you put it together into one pool, all that blood, all gathered together, it would be like going from the southern border, or the northern border, southern border of New Hampshire, northern border of Massachusetts, going all the way to Mount Washington, and digging a channel about 20 miles deep, and taking that channel and running it to Ohio to fill that blood. About 20 miles deep is about 18 Mount Washingtons on top of each other blood. Just a channel of blood. Out of seven billion. Not to mention all the ones who died already prior to Noah in the primeval age. Not to mention all that has died. Not to mention all the bugs, birds, and beasts all through the age. Not to mention all the ones who have died since the days of Noah to the days of Christ or from Christ to. Not to mention all of that. Just the 7.7 .7 billion that are currently on earth right now. And not one of them, not one drop of it could deliver you or redeem you. Not one drop. Not one drop of bug, bird, beast, or humanity could deliver, could redeem us from the sin of our heart. Not one drop had any eternal power to bring life or infuse life or make us righteous. Not one. You could bathe in that channel of blood between here and Ohio, 20 miles deep. Imagine the earth, the, the seas are only the deepest part is 12 miles, the Mariana Trench. This is almost 20 miles deep. You could bathe and spend your time in that channel of blood of humanity and never come out clean. You'd be the same, sin, same sinful creature you went in as. You and I would be just as aimless, just as sinful if we swam between here and all of Columbus, Ohio in that channel of blood and got there and got out of it full of red and got out of it, we'd be just as sinful, just as aimless, just as decadent and just as dead as when we went in. That's what I'm talking about today. It has no power over devils, no power over depression, no powers over darkness, no powers over despair of your heart, no power over decadence or darkness or death or devils, no power. No power over the indulgence of the flesh. 
I would have just as much lustly, worldly lust working in my heart as when I went in as when I came out. Same guy, same deadly, deadly thinking. Same pride, same ego, same worldly lust, same everything. Same cursed mouth, same coarsed jokes, same aimless conduct, same desires for the value of this world. Useless man, useless man, useless man. <coughs> All that blood, yet one and a half gallons came in a body that was prepared for him. A body that was prepared for this one called Christ. His body was pierced when he was dead and poured forth blood indicating and showing us that the life was going to be poured out. His life was poured out. And the Holy Spirit was then poured out not much later. The Spirit of life. His blood signified his blood signified and illustrated that the life of the flesh, the life of the Spirit was coming forth, the Holy Spirit to give us life, eternal life. To be washed, to be redeemed, to be cleansed. It wasn't the amount of the blood that was spilt. It was the blood of Jesus Christ. It wasn't the amount of blood that was spilt. It was the blood of Jesus Christ. And it wasn't just the blood that was spilt. Just any old blood. Any old place. Any old time. But it had to be a specific place. And a specific time. And it had to be the divine blood. It had to be the blood of Jesus Christ. At Calvary. On the cross. The blood of the cross. The power of the blood is in the cross. The power of the blood is in the shedding at the cross where he lived out and brought to completion his nevertheless. Not my will, Father, but yours. And that has not changed. It had the power to purge you and I of our sins and redeem us to everlasting life. God could take a wretched man like you and I and turn us into holy men of God. How can that happen? Holy men of God that the world is not worthy to receive. Holy men of God. Holy women of God. Holy children. Made. Made new. Made fresh. Given new life by the power of the Holy Spirit. Given forth. But poured out as illustrated by the blood of Jesus Christ. As, as demonstrated by the blood of Jesus Christ. The cleansing power of Jesus Christ. Who came to an end of, of life on this earth. With a nevertheless not my will. Father but yours just as when John was writing his epistle and he says that those who do the will of God abide forever it is the, the will of God the will of God the will of God and the will of God is always as you'll find also in scripture is to submit to the Holy Spirit to surrender to suffer in his fellowship of his sufferings and his sanctification sanctified by truth If it was just the blood, and I say that reverently, if it was just the blood and said, well, just the blood, if it was just the blood being spilt, if you look at it and say, well, he came and he to shed his blood and by his blood I am free, as we sang, so true. But if you and I looked at it saying, well, it was just his blood being spilt, then couldn't that have been accomplished at Bethlehem? Just as a baby? Herod's men come in with their sword, slice up all the infants, two years old and under. Such a horrid, morbid thought coming in. Such decadence, such evil coming in with swords and slaying every child, every boy, two years old and younger. What would the news be reporting today? Back then it was the rule of the day. Kill every boy under two years old. Couldn't Jesus have just... Now's the time. Mary, you're going to suffer. You're going to see hurt. But this has to be done. Jesus is going to die in the, as, a, as a poor infant. We're going to have him cut with a sword. His blood will be spilt. And he's going to redeem mankind by doing so. Couldn't have just been done at Bethlehem. But no, not the time. 
Not the place and not the method. It has to be here, here, and here. And so therefore he's spared. Not here. That would have thwarted the plan of God. Couldn't he have just shed his blood at the devil's suggestion and thrown himself off the cliff? Throw yourself off. Angels will give charge to you and just toss yourself off. Spill, hit the rocks, spill your blood. Done. Devil, see, you didn't know I just redeemed all of mankind. Nope, not there either. Nope, not there either. Your blood's not going to be spilt there either. Could have been shed when the, his brethren in Nazareth just tried to stone him and throw him off a cliff. Could have been done there. Nope, not there either. Not time, not the place, not the manner, not the method. Nope, not there. Could have been done in Jerusalem with the Jews and the rulers were all rising up, ready to stone him again. Nope, he slipped through. Nope, not here, not there. Nope, not ready. You have no hold over him. Not done yet. Could have been done at Gethsemane where he sweated great drops of blood, yes? Nope. At Gethsemane is where it was done nevertheless. But now we must work out the nevertheless. At Gethsemane, that olive garden where he was squeezed to the point where as he sweated, drops of blood, drops of blood came out from him. His blood was spilt right there. That blood's still there. It was already in his clothes. Could have been said and done right then and there, saying, you said, never, you said nevertheless, good job, Jesus, good job, you, you, you did it. You, you said nevertheless. That's kind of like what we see in Christianity today. I said, I love you, Lord. I said, I need you, Lord. I said, I said, I said, but it must be worked out. Jesus, nevertheless, must now be proven all the way to the cross where you become sin and are forsaken by the Father and the wrath of God is sent upon you. That he who knew no sin will be sin and become sin that we might become the righteousness of God. It could have been done with the crown of thorns put on his head. Nope, not there. It could have been done when his flesh was ripped open and his back was laid open. Could have been to the point where he was unrecognizable from all being, being, being slapped, punched, and blood coming forth. Nope, not there either. Not there. Could have been when they nailed his feet and nailed his hands, right? Blood being spilt. Nope, that's not what we're looking for. That's not it. Nevertheless is this. When he's on the cross and he goes, it is finished, and he gave up the ghost. And he who knew no sin became sin. And his nevertheless was completed. And they took that spear and pierced him. And blood and water gushed out after he was dead. Completed. Nevertheless has been completed. Nevertheless, the Romans may be thinking just to make sure he's dead. But God Almighty is making sure the blood is poured out. The Romans are thinking, let's make sure he's dead. God Almighty is saying, let's make sure the blood is poured out. His nevertheless has been completed. And nevertheless what? The nevertheless that even the death of the cross, even the death of the morbid crucifixion of suffering, even at the place where his crown of thorns and ridicule and rejected by his brethren, and even come to the point where he's hung naked between heaven and earth, and where devils would be gloating, men's tails, men's tongues would be wagging, and you see all of this taking place, and his own mother's heart being wounded, and you see all of this taking place, and here he is hanging between heaven and earth, and even in his final statements he's saving a thief who was just previously ridiculing him, and here he is saying now, it is finished. The blood of the cross has come forth. The blood of the cross. The cross has been established. It's the cross of Jesus Christ. It's the blood of the cross that matters. The blood of the cross, that cross, at Calvary, at this time, here he is, now suspended, and God was well pleased. Well pleased. And he's bringing forth you and I in the same way. By his blood. 
By his blood we are healed. By his blood we are redeemed. By his blood we are, con we are consecrated. By his blood we are cleansed from all our sin and all our transgression and all of our evil deeds and evil thinking. And that's why Peter in that same section of scripture, in that same chapter, says let your conduct be holy. For your God is holy. Holy conduct. So what you apply your hands to and what you apply your feet to and where this body goes and what you give it to would have to be as a living sacrifice given unto Jesus Christ because nevertheless must reign in your soul and my soul in the same way. That nevertheless, no matter what they say, no matter nevertheless, whatever family says, nevertheless, whatever adversity, nevertheless, whatever worldly lust is working on my soul, no matter what, I nevertheless has reigned in supreme dominance because I belong to the Holy Spirit. You're a Holy Spirit person. In the midst of this graveyard of bloods and bone, there's one and a half gallons of blood that has cleansed me. One and a half gallons has come forth and shed the Holy Spirit that you and I can have life everlasting in Jesus' name. Thank you. Saints of God, in that same nevertheless, you and I cannot get past the cross. No one on this earth, no one's getting past the cross. Not in time past, not in time forward. No one comes past the cross except by the blood of Jesus Christ. The entire kingdom of God is built on the kingdom, on the blood of Jesus Christ. Everything is about the blood of Jesus Christ, the blood of the cross. It gives life, it cleanses, it makes you consecrated. The covenant is in the blood. This is my blood. This is the new covenant. This is my blood. This is the new covenant. This is my blood. This is the new covenant. Take, eat, drink. This is my blood. This is the covenant. This is what makes you one with God Almighty. But it's through the cross. The blood was shed at the cross and for you to apply that blood to your life and my life must also be a nevertheless to the cross we go. Therefore, Jesus said, pick up your cross. Daily pick up that cross and follow after me. Where this world is not worthy to receive you, but there's one and a cloud of witnesses calling upon your victory. Come, come, the Spirit, the Holy Spirit and the bride say what? Come. To follow after him. No one can go past the cross. Not even death goes past the cross. Death has no dominion past the cross. All life, all life in the kingdom of God is someone who's gone past the cross, accepted the work of the cross, lives in light of the cross. This is your salvation power at work. This is salvation power at work. Where you and I give our life to him as he gave his life for us. You've heard me say in time past that everybody likes the game show, let's make a deal. And they think they can apply that to God Almighty. Let's make a deal. But there's another game show, it's deal or no deal. And it's his way or the highway. And he's calling for you and I to give our life that nevertheless where we say yes Lord. To the kingdom of God. I've seen over the years many people who will do much sweat in work and ministry. But they won't sweat one drop of blood in Jesus, for Jesus Christ. They struggle with their self-will. And, they, live, and they, don't, they struggle with giving God their nevertheless. They're willing to do all kinds of things but the one thing, die to self. I'll do all kinds of things in ministry and help out here and there and everywhere. But to do the will of God, to be sanctified by truth, that they pull back. I see people who say, they can, well, well love rejoices in truth. Exactly, so why'd you run? Meaning you don't love the truth. God Almighty is calling for you and I to be brought near by the blood. He brings us near by the blood. Through the blood. Life infused. You enter his holy gates by the blood. And he's calling and he says in Hebrews chapter 12 verse 4. You have not yet resisted the bloodshed, bloodshed striving against sin. To what extent shall I strive against sin? To what extent will sin be striving with me? To what extent do I resist temptation? To what extent do I endure trials and tribulations and troubles all around me? To what extent have you shed your blood yet? Has blood been shed from your veins yet for the sake of Christ? Not just because you're a wrongdoer, an evildoer. 
That the Bible is calling for you and I to live the life of Jesus Christ. And he says if you have fellowship with the sufferings, if you're willing to die with him, you shall also live with him. And also he says if you endure, you will reign with him. He's calling for you and I to overcome. To live that overcoming life. The life of Jesus Christ. John wrote and says, greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. Therefore that greater, that greater person, that greater Holy Spirit, that greater one has been brought forth by the blood, the blood of the cross. And he's calling for you and I to live by the blood of the cross. The blood was poured out from his body at the cross. The spot on earth, Calvary, the same place where Abraham offered Isaac. The son was given and he rose again and he ascended into heaven and he sits at the right hand of the Father and as promised the Holy Spirit was sent, the Spirit of life, the Spirit of truth, the Spirit who gives you and I life today. And he's calling for you and I to live boldly for your loving God, for your God. Looking for his return, looking for the blessed hope. Paul writing to Titus said, looking for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. That should be fueling in our life. That should be infused in our life. And we've turned church into something we attend rather than live out. We've turned churches into various ministries of that, well, you're plugged in, we'll plug you as a door person, we'll plug you in as a, here, the, the water person, we'll plug you in over here as the one who collects the offer. We'll, we just plug them into our ministries and we say, well, they belong to the church. This is the way you belong to the church, the, the blood of Jesus Christ coming alive in you. Jesus coming alive in me and you. The entire kingdom of God is built on the blood of the cross. The blood of the innocents has been given. People have shed their blood as martyrs, burned at the stake. D difficult times came their way for the sake of the cross. Even here today we're finding people are having difficult times in their life for the sake of the cross. For the sake of living a life holy unto the Lord. It's even foreign to other Christians who look at it and say, they're kind of fanatical. They're kind of this. They're too zealous. Can't church just be something? And find out all and tell themselves all kinds of stories to feel saved yeah, rather than live saved. God is not calling for you and I to feel saved. He's calling for you and I to live saved. Amen. If I can go to church, and I remember going to church, and you've heard me tell this story when I first got saved, and we'd go to church, and they would play that music in a certain way. Today they've added smoke and lights, but back then it was just music. And they'd just get that right feeling, and they'd go like almost for a crescendo, of getting to the point where they have a crescendo. And all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit, and you just feel like, oh, that's the Holy Spirit. Because the music and the tone were just right, and the mood of the service was set just right. And they were seeking this crescendo rather than the crucible of the cross. They sought the crescendo. It's not about the crescendo, it's about the crucible. Coming to that place where he squeezes you like in Gethsemane. And when you're squeezed, what you really are sh pops out. Your fears, your frets, your wrath, your fury. When you're squeezed, the pride, the ego, the lust, whatever it is, what you default to, who you run to, who you try to get justified with, validated with. It must be the cross of Jesus Christ coming alive in you. It's the blood of confession. It's a confessing blood. It cleanses you when you confess Christ. 1 John 1, 7, 8, 9 talks about confessing. And the blood of Jesus Christ will cleanse you from all unrighteousness. It's the blood. But it's not just blood spilt at Gethsemane. And it's not just blood that was spilt at Nazareth. And it's not just blood that was spilt in Bethlehem. It's the blood that was spilt at Calvary, at the cross, by Jesus Christ. Those divine veins, those divine arteries, that divine heart that was opened up opened up his flesh. The veil was opened up. The veil was his flesh, as Hebrew says. The veil was his flesh. His flesh was the veil. It was ripped in two. It was pierced. Blood poured out. And you now have access by the blood. Amen. And you must, as it says in 1 Peter, you must know this, knowing this. It must know, like... Know it, like not just academically know it, like, oh yeah, I took that in class. It was a course that we took. I'm not talking about knowing it academically, scholarly. I'm not talking about knowing it intellectually. I'm talking about knowing it as a husband and a wife come together intimately. You know it. You love it. you one with it. You're part of it and it's part of you. You're in Christ and Christ is in you. 
The entire kingdom of God is calling for you and I to take this blood and to live this blood as on our hands and on our heart and on our head. And all that we have endeavor to do, that the, the, the doorpost of your home, the doorpost of your heart, the doorpost of your hands, the doorpost of your head, and every thought that you have is covered in the blood. And he's calling for you to be holy as he is holy and all your conduct holy. So therefore we work and we give and we're hospitable, not because it's a burden to do and I'm a Christian, that's what we're supposed to do, but because the love of God has come and redeemed us and made us one with him. So we do so without grumbling and being gripers. Grumbling and griping are part of the human nature that rises in all of us, from this pulpit and all around. You and I can easily give ourselves to grumbling and griping. Some give it more ease than others. But in this, forsake it. Let thankfulness flood your soul. I'm redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ. Redeemed, redeemed, redeemed. Let the blessed, let those that belong to God say, redeemed, redeemed, redeemed. Redeemed by the blessed, blessed hope, Jesus Christ. He's coming to your life, seeing that banner and poster back here. The Spirit gives life. If we just live that, just that one poster, let us live that. The old is gone, the new has come. Let us live that. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again I say, rejoice. Well, pastor, you're being redundant. <laughs> because there's more to life. Established in the faith. Why isn't this hitting us? Why isn't it enlivening us? Because the diner down the street is still more full on a Sunday morning than hearing the truth. And even Christians and churches everywhere is just something there. Do you want to go to church this morning? I don't know. Do you want to go? Why don't we just stay home? We'll <coughs> forsaking the assembly. And the scripture says what? Do not, Do not forsake the assembly, especially as you see the day approaching. Is the day approaching? Yes. yes. Come into this place of saying, what am I doing? Wake up! The blood was given for me. Let me live my new life and enjoy my new life and pursue my new life. I want this new life alive in me. As we heard even George Foreman give the testimony, this great boxing legend, when Jesus started coming alive in him, you've heard me tell the story, he gives the testimony. When he starts whispering, he starts hearing, Jesus is coming alive in me. Jesus is coming alive in me. And he starts screaming it in the locker room. At the time of, de of death and despair in his life, where he felt he was falling into the abyss of death and darkness, and despair was flooding his soul, and Jesus is coming alive in me. And he's screaming it in the locker room after his tremendous loss. Jesus is coming alive in me. Jesus is coming alive in me. And today he's a successful businessman, yes? A family man. He was known as the heavyweight champion of the world. He's walking down the street and he's on and, and a woman with a kindergarten class sees him, brings her whole class over and says, kids, 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 do you know who this is? And the kids are all looking at this giant of a man. Looking at him. And all of a sudden she goes, this is the champion of the world boxing champion of the world. And one of the little kids just says, nah, that's the cooking man. <laughs> <laughs> what you thought you once were, the old is past. You're now just the cooking man. <laughs> the cooking man. The guy who sells fry laters. God gave him a new life. But you know what God did? Give me a new life. He never had a big smile like he does now. He's always mad angry. Look at his old pictures. Mad, angry, frustrated, wrath, full of fury, full of wrath. The world was out to get him and he was out to pay the world back. You look at all his old photos, he's got that glare in his eyes. He was the Olympic gold, you see him waving a flag and he's got that despair look full of madness. Now, big smile. Every place he goes, big smile, big smile. God put a thankfulness in his soul. God makes this, that's the redeeming blood of Jesus Christ. God took me and made me into somebody that I am today that I could never have dreamed and didn't want to become. The last thing I want to do is be me in my old nature. And now as my new nature, the last guy I want to be is what I was. Saints of God, surrender to the blood.
Surrender to the blood of the cross. Let your nevertheless come forth. Live that nevertheless, the blood, the blood, the blood of the cross. You and I may say, nevertheless, as in Garden Gethsemane, when you felt squeezed, but what did you do with that afterwards? What did you do with that afterwards? I squandered my nevertheless. I need to do it again. It's kind of like how many times you're going to sing Surrender All. I'd better start singing it every day. Every day. Every day. Nevertheless must come alive in you. Get ready for the fight. Be fit for the fight. Be fit for the Father. Be fit for the faith. Let God make you fit in Jesus Christ's name. For the glory of God. He is coming. The blessed hope is coming. Jesus Christ is coming to judge the living and the dead. He's calling for you to not just make a decision, but when a decision is made, a decision is proven to be made. And it's proven in your steps. Even now, let the Holy Spirit squeeze you. Even now, let the Holy Spirit excite you. Even now, let the Holy Spirit bubble effervescence in you. Even now, give yourself to His love, as we say. Even now, let holiness reign in your soul. Even now, let the Holy Spirit come. Even now, let nevertheless arise. Even now, not some emotional, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I'm talking about yes, yes, yes. Say, I want this. I've been all the, look at all the lives. Where did anybody ever find any joy at the bottom of a bottle? Where did anybody see, see joy and freedom in a syringe? Where did a cursed mouth get anybody? Where did an adulterous mind get anybody? Show me the fruit. Show me the fruit of your decision. Show me the fruit of the thief. Show me the fruit of the, of, of, of the one who's, who's lazy. Show me your fruit. Show me the fruit of the one who's filled with infirmity and filled with infirm mind. Fill me, show me where the fruit of the unbeliever is. Here's the what matters, the blood of the cross. And that blood coming alive in me, consecrating, confessing, cleansing, new life in Jesus' name for the glory of God. Give him your yes in Jesus' name. God bless. Pastor.